Welcome to an oral history of the church. I'm Adam Christman. And I'm Jonathan McCormick. An oral history of the church is a conversational church history podcast coming from a Christian historiographic perspective, discussing subjects by volume or season. On this podcast, we consider history an art form. Let's get into it. Well, those of you who listened last time uh, know that we discussed four schools of historic thought, um, four schools of his- historiography. Uh, we called them the cyclical view, the historicism perspective, the uh, progressive school, uh, and the Marxist school of historiography. Uh, the cyclical school thinks that everything just goes round and round. It's a pattern. What has happened will happen. Historicism says that uh, our telling of history is shaped by our culture, and our culture is shaped by our history. So they feed back into each other. Progressivism uh, sees history as aiming slowly and steadily to uh, some positive end. And Marxist historiography historiography sees history also marching to this specific eventual utopia, but the means of getting there is through, um, through economic revolution as it progresses through the stages of de- economic development. Right. And we also talked about how history is not merely a recording of stories, but a contextualization of ourselves, a way of understanding where we sit in the in the grand scope of the human race and and how we can apply these stories to our ethical choices, our ethical living. Do we have a hopeful outlook? If so, why? Um, how do we treat people? How do we treat various systems of government or um, cultural organization or cultural problems or what have you? Um, we talked about that as well, and we just wanted to give a quick case study because of when we happen to be recording these episodes. As of uh, this moment, as Jonathan and I are on this call together, uh, the election season has finished. It is two weeks into the month of November 2016. So everyone already knows, uh, has known the results of the election for a week now. And it's interesting to see all of the different reactions to the news that Hillary Clinton, who was strongly projected to win by, gosh, all kinds of different outlets, like lots and lots of different perspectives and people and institutions. She was projected to win and didn't. Donald Trump was projected to lose and people were laughing at him and he didn't. What's even more interesting is to is to try and understand the historiographic perspective, whether it's a conscious choice or a subconscious underpinning, behind all of these reactions as well. So, Jonathan... I was hoping to talk with you just real quick about what we've been observing in in, um, the reactions of these different schools of thought regarding uh, this election. One of the things we've been dancing around is that your historiographic perspective, your way of telling history, um, reflects a worldview. Right. And one of the things that we've seen in the press really is people applying this um, in a historiographic manner. I don't know how many articles, videos, whatever I've seen responding to the 
um, to the election, framing it as how am I going to tell my kids that we elected insert pejorative toward uh, the president elect here? Sure. Um, and that's the case every time, this time and every time, right? There's always going to be people who are upset about the presidential election um, and other local elections, and of course, but um, it, it's so it's it's not just a question for this time, but every every election as well. Yes, I saw the same reaction in uh, 2008 and 2012 for yeah. uh, President Obama. It was just a different set of friends or a different set of news people yeah. um, who were saying that the moon was turning to blood. And uh... <laughs> Yeah, and actually the, your joke betrays that a lot of those people thought along apocalyptic um almost biblical terminology lines with regards to president obama's election the first time and the second time and uh it's interesting this time around to see uh materialists which is a philosophical statement not a madonna <laughs> avaricious kind of statement uh materialists anti-supernaturalists um secularists coming at their uh, frustration and expressing their disappointment and anger in a very different way, not using biblical terminology, but worried about uh, very earthly, concrete problems, but making it sound like World War Three is about to come or uh, a new Holocaust or something like that. Yes, I remember the my Facebook had the trending topics. One of the trending topics was um, a Holocaust-related term, and you clicked on it, and it was all discussion of Donald Trump. Yeah, which we don't need to get into all the details of that. We don't really <laughs> want to get into all the details of that. Let's get back to what we were going to talk about, Let's talk about it. which was the uh, the responses uh, that seemed to come from the four historiographic perspectives we discussed last time. So the first one we discussed was the cyclical perspective, and what I've seen from those in the more traditionally uh, Jewish mindset and some others um, has often been. I mean, not all. You can't you can't paint every perspective with a with a broad brush that covers everybody, but a lot of the folks that I've seen who I know uh, think through issues with a cyclical worldview as far as history is concerned, come at it with a bit of cynicism. Um, some of them are um, pointing to uh, actually the 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 Holocaust as this is going to come around again. Um, or the Japanese internment camps in America. This is going to come around again, but for Muslims this time. Um, and there are others in the cyclical perspective that I've seen saying, this isn't anything we haven't seen before. Everything's yeah. going to continue on kind of as it has, generally speaking, uh, because it's a big, unwieldy government. And um, even as president, Donald Trump will only have so much direct ability to make changes along the way that he wants. And in the same vein, I've seen people who seem to espouse a cyclical worldview um, pointing out all of the other um, racist, crude, or bizarre American presidents that we've had. Mm -hmm. um, there seem, it seems to be pick on LBJ um, season because <laughs> uh, that's the uh, examples I keep seeing. Yeah. Um, but certainly there have been other people, other movements, and you could go further back beyond American history right. and pick up other people you want to set aside as examples of this cycle. There's also in 
Um, I would, I would, if I'm remembering correctly who I read them from, I think these are cyclical folks as well. Um, a lot of other folks are pointing to France and uh, potentially Germany and uh, other European nations as likely to follow what America did, which uh, we followed what Britain did this last summer mm -hmm. in in that aspect of uh, a populist uh, right wing or far right wing movement that um, pulled the the nation or the nation's policies at least more towards a nationalist bent rather than a globalist bent. So we had uh, Brexit this summer and then the election of Donald Trump in America, and other folks are pointing, well, it's going to come around again in France. Uh, Marine Le Pen is going to going to get in and going to make France worse, and then uh, in Germany it's going to come around there, and in uh, Italy and Greece and all these other places. So uh, I've seen a lot of cynicism, I would say. Um, but we should probably move on to the historicism perspective. Um what, what I have, have you not. Go ahead. I have not seen many his, people who would I class who I would classify as historicists talking about the election. I agree. Um, uh, I've had the same experience. Um, most of the folks that I've I've read about this are cyclical, progressive, a couple of Marxists, and. Um, mm -hmm more of the Christian, the, uh, two, the two Christian perspectives that we're going to discuss later in this episode. Um, but I haven't really seen, not that I know of at least, uh, an article by a historicist. I've tried to look for some and I'm just, either I'm searching poorly mm -hmm. um, or they're being quiet right now. Well, it only has been a week. You can't blame the historicists <laughs> for taking more than a week to... Uh, I don't think they're big on hot takes. I think they're more on uh, the cold bakes. <laughs> yeah. Now, we have certainly seen a number of progressive... And I'm not using progressive pejoratively. Certainly. Um, uh, it's the particular perspective on understanding history and history writing. And their their response seems to be this is a setback. Right. This is really awful. But 2020's coming soon. <laughs> right, that's right. Um this may be most especially seen in uh what's called the cold open of Saturday Night Live. It's that it's that thing, if you've ever watched that show, and who hasn't watched that show? But uh, <laughs> it's the thing that they lead with, where they have some sketch that ends with and live in New on, in, from New York at Saturday Night. The one that they did after the election, you've probably seen it already. It's um, Kate McKinnon, a cast member who does the, the Hillary Clinton... Um, um, oh my goodness, I'm forgetting the word. Impersonation. She's playing the piano just very quietly and softly and singing a cover of Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah, as if we haven't heard that a hundred million times. Um, he did die uh, this last week, of course. Um, unfortunately, I don't know much of his body of work outside of Hallelujah, People keep playing Hallelujah, and it makes me not want to go look up Leonard Cohen. <laughs> not that that's a bad song, but because it's just been played so much around me. Anyway, in the sketch, she quietly, softly plays this, this song and sings it, and um, almost comes to tears uh, once or twice. And then uh, she had a couple of lines of dialogue about how she's not going to give up and neither should you. And that was it. Um, I don't and think I don't think SNL could more clearly state they wanted Hillary Clinton to win 
than the sketches they've been doing over the last year. <laughs> but that one, I think, especially nails it. The, a, a progressive view of history. History uh, leads us further towards uh, utopia. We get better. Every, you know, every decade is better than the one before. We're going to uh, have uh, liberty for all in the way that we define it. And um, anybody who doesn't get on board with what we are trying to do is setting us back and not helping us progress. Um, so it was, it was certainly the progressives lament. It's 2016. <laughs> That's right. Well, and then, um, the couple of Marxists that I read seem to have pretty mixed feelings. They really wanted Bernie Sanders to get the nomination because they feel that he could have won. Or at least that if he had lost, they could have accepted the, the results a little more. I don't know. Uh, it, it's a very mixed situation, I think, at this moment regarding Marxist historiography on the 2016 election. What do you think? There... I think their understanding of um, of in some senses is mixed, but they would all they all seem to fairly agree that um, Trump is the success of the capitalist system mm -hmm. over the. Um, over the impressed workman um, and whether it's the immigrant, whether it's uh, the people who are underrepresented and suffer from um, environmental cal calamities, whatever it is. Um, Donald Trump is, is bad news. And because of the violence that comes from, the results of his policies, it may be worthwhile to, you know, block up a freeway by getting out and getting 50 or your friends to stand in the middle of the freeway. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying they not commenting on whether or not their concerns are valid. I think those pro the people who are protesting in the streets, the election, mm -hmm. are exemplifying this um, this Marxist worldview. Yeah. Yeah, I think you might be right. Well, uh, we should probably move on from this piece to get to the, the bulk of the episode, the meat, as it were. So that was just a little appetizer. We wanted to talk about... Um, Christian historiography more specifically. Not that a Christian historian couldn't have one of the four um, perspectives we discussed last time. But um, yeah. when you get more into the nitty gritty of history as it relates to the biblical texts, um, you, you get into what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, um, Christian historiography, I would say, is centered around the idea that Jesus is Lord mm -hmm. and that he is the center of history. Mm -hmm. uh, he's the, he is the figure that gives history its, its deepest importance. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, this that doesn't seem to be enough to get to a historiographic school, mm -hmm. but we have with and embedded in this certain worldview presuppositions. Mm -hmm. um, like we've talked about um, Marxist historiography as being a materialistic um, perspective. Right or an anti-supernatural perspective. Mm -hmm. Christian historiography at its core is a supernaturalistic perspective. 
Uh, right. We believe that there is more to the universe than what the five senses can identify. That there is a spiritual reality that impacts the natural world. Mm-hmm. Now, that doesn't mean our first response and only response to history is to say, God did it. You know, mm-hmm. It is kind of cheating to say, <laughs> why did Lincoln get shot? God did it. Well, <laughs> now finish your beans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's not enough. Yeah. But we're trying to see not just some curving arc toward goodness, Mm -hmm. but how this arcs toward God's plan. Right. Right. We, in a way, are looking at history as arcing toward a utopia, but that's, it's only because Christ has redeemed the arc of history. He's infused it with grace leading us to that end. So, So, go ahead. So Christianity is going to see things having dual causes very frequently. There's uh, the immediate or the proximate cause, you know. Mm -hmm. But there's also the ultimate cause, of God's work in history. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that's going to be really hard to work out. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Election 2016 is ringing in my ears right now. <laughs> <laughs> but on personal levels, you're if you're doing a history of a of a church or of a people group or of a city or a county. Um, You can notice the death of uh, an influential person cut off before their time. Hmm. And you have to say, how does that, how does that fit with, with God working all things to good? Right. This is bad. One example, maybe an easy example, but one example is the uh, theologian Jonathan Edwards. Mm-hmm. He died a young man, relatively young man. I mean, he had he was married, he had kids, uh, kids who were growing towards uh, marriageable age. But he had just become... I, I could, I, <laughs> when I first read the story, I couldn't believe it. He had just become president of, um, uh, excuse me, oh my goodness, now I'm forgetting if it was Princeton or Yale. I'm doing a terrible job with my history right now. Yale. Yale, thank you. He had just become president of Yale. And, no, that can't be right. It's got to be Princeton. Come here, Google. (laughs) Hello, Google, my old friend. Yes, I'm going to live Google something on the show. Get over it. Um, so, because there's the Yale Library, but it's it's odd because he was, yes, he was the third president of Princeton. Okay. So, the Sorry Ivy League school that. that everybody knows, or at least everybody in America knows, he just became president of Princeton. It was like three weeks, I think, something like that. Mm-hmm. And um, he believed so strongly in vaccinations that he said, yeah, I'll get one. And as a religious and educational leader, um, people can see that they work and they'll follow suit. And holy cow, I just died from my vaccine. Um, he died suddenly because he got sick from his uh, smallpox vaccine or whatever it was. Um, so that's 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 one example uh, about what you're talking about. So within this, we also do biblical historiography. Uh, Aside from just looking at the general arc of history, 
Christians have read the Bible, and we think that the Bible is a historical document mm -hmm. that it records historical events with the purpose of telling people about history. Mm -hmm. It has theological ends, it has political ends, it has um, ethical ends, mm -hmm. all those things. But when it says that um, Jesus was a man, Mm -hmm. we we, we assume it that it's yeah we take it at its word at face value yeah jesus was a man that he traveled from this place to another place and that he did this this event occurred at this at the first place and this other event happened at the next and we try to we try to map those out if you open pretty much any bible you'll find maps in the back that that indicate the travels of Paul the Apostle, or the ministry of Jesus, or the the Hebrew people as they left Egypt and um, made their way to the Promised Land, because Christian historians have taken these historical texts as legitimate historical documents on the people and events that are represented there. Exactly. So within biblical historiography, there are going to be some two groups that we're going to talk about. Uh, the first one we're going to call maximalists. Um, mm -hmm. This would be people who, who come to the biblical text with a general assumption that the the biblical authors aren't going to lie to the to their reader mm -hmm. that they are that this is not ancient propaganda right and they require the presupposition that supernatural events can occur in time and space and so they allow for the possibility that um, miraculous stories, burning bush, uh, the feeding of the 5,000, etc., could actually happen here on Earth, as opposed to our, our next perspective. And it's this isn't to say, well, God did it, so... This, of course, happened, and there is no scientific or physical explanation for these events occurring. Mm -hmm. Right, so we, even within maximalist thought, there is there's a range. The, the best representatives will do the work of digging into the science behind these things or the art uh, looking at the archaeological side of history um, and looking at archaeology legitimately not as a, a gotcha but as another uh, access to another set of I'm going to use the word documents metaphorically yeah potsherds um, stila um, engravings these kinds of quote-unquote documents are uh they will work with all of these things and more to try and best understand what happened uh how it happened when it happened and so on um I, well you, even... you'll have crackpots within the maximalist side who will do the opposite of what you just said jonathan they'll just say well <laughs> god said it uh that settles it that's it. I'm not going to question anything about it. Sure. I mean, we we have to we have to we have to grant that. But the best representatives don't merely do that. They dig in and give it um, legitimate time to mull over and uh, work through the issues related to the text or the problem that they're facing. Agreed. 
So some representatives of this view, in case you're interested in checking out um, some exemplars of this. Uh, for the Old Testament, we have uh, V. Phillips Long. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll give some book recommendations um, in a moment. Um, but he wrote uh, um, Art of Biblical History. Um, and so that's that helps show his understanding of history. Mm -hmm. And we would have uh, people like Craig Blomberg uh, and his books, the, the Historical Reliability of the Gospels right. and mm -hmm. the Historical Reliability of John. Right. And even uh, there's another scholar named uh, Daniel Wallace who has taken on uh, similar issues as, as Blomberg, uh, also coming at it from a maximalist perspective. He has more articles on the subject and um, lectures and debates, uh, whereas Blomberg has those published books. Um, if you're interested in watching a kind of back and forth debate, uh, we can we'll give you a tip to that actually after we talk about the minimalists because one of the representatives there was the other side of that conversation actually. Are you ready to move on to minimalists, Jonathan? Yes. So how so would you define if, the minimalist perspective? So if maximalists come to the biblical data with a supernaturalist perspective and with a hermeneutic of trust, mm -hmm. generally assuming that the Bible is not trying to be deceptive, um, the Minimalists come to the to the biblical text with what would be called a, a hermeneutic of suspicion, mm -hmm. and with a an anti supernaturalist or a naturalistic um, pers perspective, mm -hmm. uh, an assumption that. When the the Bible talks about supernatural things, that this is a sort of political statement, um, or some other, uh, there's something other than something else going on a speech act or right, right. But it doesn't actually reflect verbatim history. Right, so they might argue that a given text is, well, rather than merely reporting a history of something that happened to some of God's people at this certain time, this is more a propaganda piece to convince, uh, let's say, the Persian overlords during the exile, hey, the Jewish people aren't so bad, you should let us be in charge of some stuff, and maybe let us send some of our people home. Or, for the New Testament an apologetic saying we're not really crazy people who want to overthrow the government. <laughs> right. um, you should stop throwing us to the lions. Right. Right. Exactly. Right, uh, so, which that actually century. is part of what the apologists do in the first and second century. Right. Um, not to make light of that, but of that's, not necessarily what the biblical authors are doing from our right. maximalist position. And that's why you have to understand the perspectives underlying the, the people talking about these scriptures. Because if you assume that the scriptures were written in the 2nd or 3rd or 4th century, then you are more likely to come at it with the perspective that you just mentioned, Jonathan, that, oh, well, they're, they just want the Romans to stop murdering Christians. That's all. No big deal. I mean, what's complicated about that? But if you, if you come at it more with the maximalist perspective, continuing with the, the New Testament as an example, you will take it at more uh, face value as, as a truth-telling document that these 
were written by people in the first century to people in the first century dealing with the actual problems that they say that they're dealing with or uh, telling the history that they say they are telling. Um, so it's there's a significant there is a very significant difference there. Um, in in this camp, however, the minimalist perspective, you have some some serious scholars that have um, clarified and um, helped to popularize the uh, minimalist perspective. For the Old Testament, we have um, well a couple of examples. We have Philip Davies and Lester Graby. Um, each has, has written uh, relatively prolifically, and they each come at the, the biblical histories with that hermeneutic of suspicion that you mentioned, Jonathan. And so they take the, the Exodus to be at a very different time period than somebody like V. Phillips Longwood, or uh, they take the uh, books of the Chronicles, for example, that were written during the exile to communicate perhaps something significantly different um, than what somebody like like V. Phillips Long or um, Ian Prov Provan would, would say. And then when we come to the New Testament, uh, we have uh, Bart Ehrman. Uh, he's engaged in debate with Wallace, um, and his uh, they've co-edited volumes together. So not just doing popular work, but also scholarly writing back and forth on this issue. Yeah. Um, Ehrman is actually the one that our listeners are most likely to have heard of. Um, if you haven't heard of all these other scholars, you've probably heard of Bart Ehrman, um, even if only in passing. His books uh, have been especially popular over the last 10 years, um, really hitting, I would say, probably the, the most provocative peak was um, probably in the mid-aughts. Um, one of his books is Jesus Before the Gospels, meaning what was... Who's the Jesus uh, before these um, these texts that the Christians called scriptures? Um, and most of his other books have basically the same title, just different variations of the same idea, because <laughs> he just keeps writing the same thing. Um, <laughs> he's he's more of a popularizer than these others that we've discussed. Um, although we should probably talk about what the difference between traditional scholar and a popularizer but anyway um so bart ehrman is he is he is generally a good scholar he does a lot of good work and if you really want to understand a minimalist perspective on the new testament i would immediately point you to bart ehrman if you want to understand what that is you want to understand what it's like you go read what he's written agreed he is generally fair um, to his the other scholars mm -hmm. generally, mm -hmm. um, there's everyone has their faults, um, and he does understand the maximalist perspective. Mm -hmm. um, he had studied with uh, Bruce Medsker, who was a, a a maximalist scholar of the previous generation. So these are with these two schools in mind now, we can think about the different Christian historians as we read books about um, the Holy Roman Empire now and uh, the Crusades and even the early church years, uh, even American Christianity. We now have um, kind of a good starting place to understand who we're reading when we see them uh, make comments that either assume the veracity of a miraculous account or or not, or someone who gives uh, the benefit of the doubt to the Christian scriptures 
and those who treat it as... This is another interesting text from history past that is not necessarily more valuable than any other for understanding this particular period or people group or whatever. Agreed. A Christian historian is not necessarily limited to doing biblical history. Right. And you can be a historian who is a Christian without actively being a Christian historian. Mm -hmm. That's not something I would necessarily, that's not my path to go down. But it's possible to be a, a Christian historian, but be a part of one of these other four schools, mm -hmm. um, either functionally in all of your writing or in, um, in perspective. Yeah. But to that end, we, being a Christian historian does not mean we get to be lazy about our use of resources mm -hmm. or dishonest with our use of resources. That's right. Right. So we may want to get the gospel out there, but if we, if we tart up some historical figure as if they were this perfect epitome of the Christian faith and ignore all of the accounts and anecdotes that demonstrate that he or she had this significant character flaw or made this terrible miscalculation or um, that he or she threw out an entire um, orthodox perspective on a particular doctrine or whatever. We, we are not doing good work, period. Whether you are a Christian or not <laughs> does not change the fact that you have to do good work or you won't you won't be doing good work at all. So you have, like you just said, Jonathan, you, we have to treat our sources well, fairly, honestly. Um, we have to do the best that we can with every resource available uh, in every meaning of the word resource. Um, but you were going somewhere with this, Jonathan. Go ahead. I'm sorry. There's another tendency to try to baptize historical figures mm -hmm. and make them either Christian or if they're a Christian, our particular kind of Christian, mm. um, to make it fit our worldview instead of acknowledging when there are difficulties with the data. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've you and I have seen this quite a few times over the last several years, especially. Um, you, you, Jonathan and I both come from Baptist backgrounds um, our whole lives, each of us. Mm -hmm. And so we have seen, in recent years especially, attempts by our Baptist brethren to baptize all manner of groups into, hey, look! Baptists, they're bad. They're totally, they're super Baptists over there. They totally are. Ignore all that other stuff. They are totally Baptists. I mean, <laughs> ignore the fact that it's like 1,500 years ago or, <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, Jonathan. Yes, I do. <laughs> and we will, we will likely get into that in another episode. Yeah. But there's also this tendency... Um, when we look at the American Revolution, um, people like um, uh, 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 John Barton, who are wanting to make all of the founding fathers all spotless Christians, and not just spotless Christians, but 20th century evangelical um <laughs> anti-slavery progressive on that issue christians um that's right he wants he wants them to be spotless whitewashed tombs that's that's a very good analogy jonathan 
and <laughs> unfortunately, um, that's just not the case. So Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson was a deist. It's 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 not honest. Yeah, straight up, he was simply a deist. There were there were Christians who are in our founding fathers. We're not denying that, of course, but we have to treat each of them individually and honestly about who they were and what they thought. And it's disrespectful. If we somehow got Bart Ehrman on this show to talk about um, Christian, uh, about historiography, it would be dishonest for the next week to say, and famed maximalist Bart Ehrman came on our show uh, <laughs> to talk about the resurrection of Jesus. That's right. And we know he's a maximalist because he talked to, he said Jesus name and he talked to us and we are maximalists. Um, and he enjoys cheeseburgers like I do. <laughs> See? So See? If... He's a maximalist, you guys. Ignore all the other data that 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 may question or <laughs> my perspective or even prove it wrong. So just as it would be disrespectful to do this to our contemporary mm -hmm. and, and really to... make our show look foolish. <laughs> and to the people who are who are either reading that book or, in this case, listening to this podcast, it would be disrespectful to them as well. It, you treat them as chumps when you don't do good a good job and you don't try to do an honest, hard labor to the, attempt to accurately represent who this person was or who these people were or what this city was about in that time. So we want we will try to give the best of the best of who we encounter. Yeah. Uh we're we're going to try to give you people worth reading. Mm -hmm. Um when we mention books. Um That's because right. we 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 want to respect you our audience. Um and we respect the work that it takes to be a historian. That's right. So even though Jonathan and I both strongly disagree with a number of Bart Ehrman, to continue with this example, I don't want to harp on him too much. I'm just, I'm a New Testament scholar, so I'm more familiar with his work. Even though Jonathan and I both strongly disagree with several of his conclusions, we have to respect the work that he put into his all of his his work that he's done all of his texts whether it's articles or books or something else he's done a lot of work to try and understand the issues and present as best he can the perspective that he holds and he's done a really darn good job of presenting a minimalist new testament uh study and so if you want to understand what that's like you know this is why we point you to him so people to point to uh, a great introductory work on on history from a christian perspective it aims mainly at the title's gonna give it away uh biblical history uh Art of Biblical History by V. Phillips Long. Uh, he worked with Ian Pravon and Tremper Longman on uh, a biblical history of Israel. Mm -hmm. um, so this sort of applies that framework he discusses and goes through the his historical portions of the Old Testament to try to give you a, a history from the Bible. That's right. So if you're ready to move on from how to do history and want to get your hands on some history uh, of the biblical the biblical texts the old testament texts especially um that's a really good one you can't go wrong with that one uh, likewise another um, maximalist perspective comes from a scholar named bill arnold he wrote um a uh a more entry-level book that I really 
uh, I think is really well written, called Encountering the Old Testament. So it's it's a very good historical text to kind of, and it has other elements, of course. But if you're interested in history, this will help you as well to get your 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 mind around uh, reading the Old Testament and understanding those historical texts in it. And he also has a, a brand new book that actually came out today. <laughs> I'd like to read it. I'm going to see if I can get my hands on it. It's called The World Around the Old Testament, The People and Places of the Ancient Near East. Uh, so if, like me, you're interested, uh, you can get yourself a copy of that and read about the the place in which God's people were set. If you want to know about everything around them and in order to best understand them, uh, you need a book like this kind of book. And Bill Arnold is a... Um, he does good work, so he would be a good one to, to read for that. The world of the Old Testament is a world of political intrigue, of religious ritual, economics. It's really fascinating to see what happened in the, the ancient Near East. Yeah. Uh, a minimalist author, again, will... Uh, We'll point at uh, Bart Ehrman. We said Jesus before the Gospels. Uh, that's, I believe, the one of the newest books that he's done on that issue, mm -hmm. um, and it's from for a more popular audience. Um, and for the Old Testament, um, Davies uh, Philip Davies wrote um, a history of biblical Israel, a guide for the perplexed. Um, he comes from a minimalist view of the Old Testament, mm -hmm. and he sort of does what Wong is doing in his um, art of biblical history, but from the other side. Yeah, exactly. Well, I hope you guys read uh, one of those books, at least. Um, I know I enjoyed uh, what I have read from each of these these writers well this has been the second episode of our second volume our next episode in volume two uh episode three will be where we discuss the three canons of historiography uh what are the three tools that historians use to craft history uh and that will come up in two weeks on december 2nd so these tools aren't literal canons with like the iron ball and the gunpowder. Yes, really hoping. yes. I mean, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Barterman and I'll meet out on the, the grassy lawn and fire um, <laughs> giant cannons, uh, nerf cannons at each other, at least. Uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm sure we will get to a story involving cannons uh, someday. <laughs> well, if you the listener have any questions about something that we have already discussed or anything at all, really, you can email us at, and here it is, church history podcast. Isn't that easy? Church history podcast at gmail.com church history podcast with no spaces. So just church and then history and then podcast at gmail.com. I mean, we'll answer, yeah. you know, we haven't gotten one yet. So this is only the second episode. And uh, we've only been putting that email out there for now two episodes as of this time. <laughs> but if you send them in, we, we'll we'll try to we'll try to answer those on the on the podcast. It's a hard balance when you're you're teaching uh, to to balance between teaching a content and teaching a person. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the only way we can make sure that we are adequately doing the second part of that is to make sure that our listeners who hopefully are wanting to learn uh information from us uh if you give us feedback and say hey i want to know more about this um uh, we can only do that if we hear from you that's right well uh then finally we want to talk about our new companion podcast again we announced it last time and if you missed that episode, 
we have a new, our new companion podcast is called Saints Gone Before. That one launches on Monday, December fifth. Saints Gone Before is it's like uh it's it's like an audiobook podcast where Jonathan and I will alternate one episode, it'll be me, one will be him reading to you um, texts that we think are interesting, you know, helpful, and especially those that are important from Christian history. These episodes will be short, uh, something that you could listen to over a short commute. Uh, and we will give the, the document that we're, we're reading, we'll give some relevant data on you, how you mm -hmm. can find it, and read it uh, either on your own if you like or if you like following along with the text mm -hmm. uh, you can do it that way too that's right I mean they'll come from all different places it'll be books it'll be short texts it'll be sermons it'll be articles it'll be essays it'll be hymns it'll be prayers um, it'll be all, all kinds of things we'll begin with um, uh a very ancient Christian document called the Didache. Uh, that is going to be split up over two episodes. The first one being, again, on Monday, December 5th. And that'll be a weekly podcast, because we can produce that a lot more easily. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jonathan, did you have anything else uh, before we, we got out of here? We hope that you've enjoyed this, and if you have aspirations of being a historian, I hope our the big takeaway has been to be respectful to um, the other perspectives that you would encounter, um, and to be fair with our resources. That's right. May God bless you as you go. He's already gone before. Mm -hmm.